It is time for the annual of Valentine's Banner, and based on the silhouettes, it looks like we're getting Myrrh and Ephraim. Now, there are two questions we have to ask. Is this going to be like a typical Sacred Stones banner where it's like Erica, Ephraim, Leon, Tana, and this, maybe something like that? Are we going to get someone new? And the other question is, are we going to get an improved warp bubble effect on Murr? Because that could have some big meta implications. Well, let's find out. Let's jump straight into it. Okay, first up is Murr. There we go. So she's not going to be the demote. Okay, let's start at the top with her preference weapon, Loving Breath. Okay, so we have Slaying, we have Distant Counter, which is pretty cool. We have some stats, so she pretty much gets attack plus X and attack minus X, up to 14, and it's based off the allies within three spaces. She gets Special Acceleration, she gets Healing after combat, and then also if the foe initiates combat or if their HP is greater than equal to 75%, they're going to do a res check, and based off that res check, she'll get damage reduction. So it's essentially like Dragon Wall, right? And then of course you get the Dragon Adaptive Damage. Overall, pretty solid weapon, it looks pretty good, but we'll have to see what the rest of her kit is to really get a full feel of how good she is. We also get the introduction of a defense res scow, which is really, really nice. This is awesome for those more tanky um, dragons who don't really care about attack or speed and they just want to survive, right? So this is a very, very good effect. I'd love to see this like a Medius. We then have a new B skill, Candy Fighter. Now what Candy Fighter is is the exact same thing as like Weeding Fighter on like Winter Byla. The only difference is the stats you get. So if instead of doing attack and defense minus four, it's now attack and res minus four. But other than that, they're the exact same skill. So that's kind of weird that they would even do this considering there's so many other skills we need in the like, game right now. Getting such a small stat difference, I don't think is really that big of a deal and probably not worth it in most situations, but I guess they wanted to do that. So that's what Candy Fighter is. But then we have a new preference C skill, Darkling Dragon, and this is where I am scared. Wow, this is a very powerful preference skill. So Darkling Dragon, what this essentially does, at the beginning of the turn, Murr is going to get uh, defense and res plus six and warp bubble if she's within two spaces of an ally. So that's already like legendary Murr, right? But then also, she's also going to grant defense and res plus six and the warp bubble effect to any support partner she has within two spaces of herself. And if there's no support partner, she's going to do the Brave Soren and she's going to choose the unit with the highest defense within two spaces. This is absurdly strong, right? This is very, very strong. We've seen how good Warp Bubble can be on Legendary Murr. She was pretty meta for a little while because of the anti-warping and how powerful Guidance Floor became last year. But now being able to not only have it on your save unit, but also being able to have it on an ally means you can shut down warping really, really effectively until Murr dies, right? And then even then you still get one more like turn essentially because of the support partner. But then after that, it's gone. But it also does some other things as well. You also get... Uh, if you're within two spaces of an ally, you get Guard, which is really, really good for armors, and you get 50% damage reduction, which is just nuts. Like, like, giving that to an armor, oh my gosh. And then finally, you get the save skill. So if you are attacked by a range uh, foe, so far save, you'll get attack, defense, and res plus four. So all the stats she really needs. Uh, this is an absurdly powerful skill. Like, right, this is like very, very, very good. This definitely is anti-meta. It's going to help to shut down warping. Now, the thing is, I definitely want to point out is that when you're playing Summoner Duels in particular, your save is typically the first unit to die. That's just how it works. Typically, your far save goes in and they die, and then the rest of the trading happens, right? Now, that doesn't mean that Warp Bubble is worse. It just means that that is something you have to consider, right? Because a lot of times what will happen is you'll go into combat, someone's going to kill your save, you kill their save, and then everything goes crazy, right? With this, what will happen essentially is you'll go in, you'll kill Murr, but then the ally support partner will still be there to stop warping for that turn. And so that's really, really powerful for that turn because all the trading typically happens right then, right? It's like a, just a straight trade war. And so being able to turn off warping even after your death for one turn, thanks to your support partner, is really powerful. It's combining roles, right? It's combining those two roles that you'd want from like something from Gatekeeper or from like Legendary Murr. And putting it into a role that's better because like gatekeeper is a support unit but he's not very good in sd because he can't kill anything and then Murr is a support unit but she's like only good as a frontliner and not even the best at that anymore so like she really struggles to find the role she wants to be because typically when you have a melee flyer they act as a guidance spot and Murr can't do that so i think this is ridiculously like ridiculously ridiculously powerful and i think we're gonna see a lot of Murr. though i do think she's not gonna be like meta warping i think she'll be very powerful Okay, when it comes to roles for Murr, obviously she's a tank. She's a tank and a support, really. That's the two things she's going to be doing. And when it comes to the game modes, I think Murr's going to be just amazing in pretty much every game mode. Uh, she's going to be really good in Aetherade's defense because she can shut down warping. So that means that, like, Winter Elgar will actually have to walk up and hit you. She can't just, like, charge in, which is a very big deal. 
she's gonna be amazing in summoner duels once again because warping is so prevalent there so being able to shut that down is gonna be very good as well and so i think those are probably gonna be the two main game modes you're gonna see her in obviously she'll do really well in arena as well because she scores extremely high as a dragon armor but either way let's move on to the next character okay up next is ephraim bad surprise so these are the two silhouettes we saw last night let's start at the top with this preference weapon righteous lance Okay, so we have a slaying, and then also Ephraim's going to have a support effect where he grants attack and defense plus 4 to all allies within 3 spaces and 7 HP after their combat. So you get some nice like little support there with Ephraim, which is cool. And then if the foe initiates combat, or if their HP is greater than 75%, you're going to get some stats, right? You're going to inflict attack and defense minus X from the foe, up to 14, which is a very solid number, obviously. You're going to get 30% damage reduction, but not against AoEs, and you're going to heal 7 HP after combat. Now the crazy thing is if the foe initiates combat or once again their HP is greater than equal to 75%, you're going to ignore their damage reduction. So you're just going to go right through and just destroy them, which is really good, right? Because as we've been talking about a lot, Omni tanks and saves need damage reduction piercing to secure kills. So Ephraim just has it built into his weapon. He also has Armored Blaze, and then he has a new A skill, Earthfire Boost, which is going to grant HP plus 5, and then if your HP is greater than equal to 50%, you'll get the attack and defense plus 7, and you'll get Guard. So this is essentially the same as like Fire Flood Boost, it's just the attack and defense version, which is it's very good. Glad to see that in the game. But of course we have Ephraim's new preference skill yet again, because last year he got one and now he needs another new one. Sunlit Bangle D. So what this is essentially going to do, it's very similar to Summer Ephraim's Sunlit Bangle, but a little bit different. And what this essentially is going to do is if you initiate combat, once again the foe gets to counterattack first, which can charge your special. Then also you're going to inflict attack and defense minus 5 on the foe, which is a little bit less than Summer Ephraim's because his can actually stack based off how much movement you get. But you do get Anti-Guard, which is really, really strong as it's going to make sure that you can just destroy things, right? Which is great. You're also going to get that Brave effect, just like Summer Ephraim, and you're also going to heal 7 HP per hit. So overall, this is still a pretty strong preference B skill. The thing is you have to consider, of course, is that as an armor, you are losing your fighter skill, right? So you're losing your chance to use hardy fighter or to use like weaving fighter or whatever else, right? Now, this is a very powerful skill, so it can definitely be worth it because it's going to give Ephraim a ton of firepower. You're pretty much going to attack into him. He's going to hit you back twice and he's going to hit you with a special and he's going to ignore your DR. So he's definitely going to be a more offensive save, which is good. But at the same time, he needs a lot of like defensive power just to survive, right? Because the nukes are so insane right now. I think Ephraim will be a very cool and unique save unit. But I'm a bit worried about his survivability. Now, when it comes to roles, obviously Ephraim's main role is going to be a tank. He's kind of a nuke tank, but that's pretty much what he's going to be doing. And then when it comes to game modes, I could see him being used in Aether Raid's defense as like a near save unit, which could be really, really strong. I could also see him being used as like a far save, possibly an SD, but we'll have to see how good his survival actually is. Okay, who is the demo? The demo is Selena. Why? Why does she have so many alts? I don't understand. Like, she's a popular character, but she's not that popular. There's so many other characters that could be getting this. I don't understand. This is like the Ursula thing all over again. I really just don't get this. <laughs> like, she's cool, but like, there's so many other characters who could be getting alts right now. Okay, let's start at the top with Devoted Basket, our new inheritable red tome. And man, this is a pretty good red token. Essentially what you're going to do is if your HP is going to go 25%, at the beginning of combat, you're going to do X% percent of the foe's attack as combat begins. So like you're going to get pre-combat damage, and the amount is going to be either based off if you outspeed the unit or if you have weapon triangle advantage, right? So if you're fighting against a green unit, you're going to get 30% of their attack as pre-combat damage. Otherwise, you'll get 15%, which is still pretty good, right? You're also going to get attack and speed plus 5 during combat, and you're going to get a boost to attack and speed equal to 15% of your speed at start of combat. So that visible speed. This is a really good and terrible tome. Like, this is very, very solid. So, I mean, honestly, this is really cool. Good fodder. Rally up attack is nice. Attack speed catch 3 is okay. Not amazing. And far trace is also nice, but not once again amazing. Overall, pretty good. Really wish it was somebody else, though. I'm not going to lie. Let's move on to our duo unit of the banner. Okay, who is our... I, I was right. It's Leon and Erica. Who would have seen this coming, right? It had to be. So we have Duo Leon. They look really good. I love this. This is really cute. Uh, he's a green tome cav. Okay, okay. Let's see what Leon can do. Because I love Leon. He's one of my favorite characters of all of Fire Emblem. So once again, I is just going after my wallet. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> let's start at the top with his preference weapon, Tender Vessel. Okay, so we have Kanto 1. We get Slaying. And that Star of Combat, just like the Inheritable Red Tome and like Legendary Camilla, you're going to get pr like combat damage, right? right? When this combat starts, you're going to deal some damage to them in the face. And it's going to be X%. 
If you have weapon triangle advantage or if your res is greater than their res, you're going to get 40%. If not, you'll get 20%. So once again, just a ridiculous amount of damage you get for free. You're going to get plus 5 to attack, defense, and res during combat. And then you're also going to get stats additional to your attack, defense, and res equal to 20% of Leon's res at the start of combat, right? So the visible resistance, he'll get 20% of that, which is a lot, and it's not capped, so you can just get a ton. And then lastly, you're going to get 50% damage reduction piercing. So that's really good. Right? Like, honestly, this is a very strong weapon, right? We've seen how strong Camilla can be. This is very similar to Camilla's weapon. We finally have Leon having a preference skill. I am so happy about this. He definitely deserves this. We have Grey Illusion as his preference A skill. Okay, so we have Grey Illusion, and this skill is completely and utterly disgustingly just gross. Oh my god. Uh, I love Leon, but man, I do not like this. <laughs> so if unit initiates combat or if the foe's HP is greater than equal to 75%, at start of combat, you're going to get plus 9 all stats. And then if your res is greater than the foe's res, you're going to get a sweep effect, so the foe cannot counterattack. If you initiate combat, after combat, you're going to inflict a status effect on the foe with the highest speed within three spaces of your target, right? Excluding the target itself. What it's going to do is it's going to turn off their turn. Um, in Ether Raids, it's going to be after their start of turn skills trigger, but in Summoner Duels, it'll just turn their action off. Um, this is gross. This is, this is so disgusting. I don't like this at all. Oh my god, why are they going this route? This is so bad. Yeah, so this is like, do like we already had Duo Sather who turns off people's actions every single turn with a res check. And then we also had Fomortis, right? But Fomortis had to survive. So there was like a way to get around Fomortis' Nightmare. And then they took Nightmare and they just kind of threw it into Leon's A skill. Which, like, you know, it makes sense thematically, but at the same time, the fact that there's, like, really nothing the opponent can do, because it's going to hit somebody within three spaces, right? So if there's any foe within three spaces, they're going to get hit by this, and they're going to get their action turn ended. Now, it's going to hit the unit with the highest speed, so maybe if their actions are already ended, it won't take effect. We'll have to check that, but, like, this is really, really gross and powerful. The one thing I will say, I guess, is if you kill Leon, it won't activate probably. So that's another way to deal with it, I guess. Like, you have to just kill him in combat. But man, that is a very disgustingly powerful effect. Holy crap. We then also have a Cult of Strike. So now we have another way to get a Cult of Strike. And we have a new C skill, Insight Attack Res, which is going to be the exact same as Insight Attack Speed, which is just going to give you a bunch of stats in combat and that visible stat buff. But it's now just Res instead of Speed. So this is obviously a very, very good skill, and it's going to be very... Um, premium for a lot of units who are going to want this, right? Who just want to stack as many stats as possible. Now let's go ahead and check out the duo skill. Okay, so now we have Leon's duo skill where it's going to inflict the same status in cardinal directions of Leon where after start of turn skills trigger, ends action immediately, and summer duels, it just ends their action immediately. Uh, this is just gross. I really don't like this, and I don't like that it's on Leon because it makes me feel bad about loving Leon. But this is just not a good skill to add to the game, in my opinion. It makes it so that at like, any point in summoner duels, if you line up with Leon, you can hit like one unit, you can hit two units, you can hit like three units and just end their action. And if you do that, they lose the game. Like there's just no way to really recover from that. That's just game ending. Like it's so not cool. I really do not like this effect at all. I don't know why they're doubling down on it. Yeah, I don't like this at all. I really, really, really don't like this. Uh, with all that said, let's look at Leon's stats real quick. So he has 39 HP. He has 64 attack with a visible buff of 6, so like 58 attack. And then his speed and defense are being uh, debuffed, and his res is being buffed. So it's probably 43 resistance. So the one thing I will say about Leon is that he is very slow, unlike Camilla. And so he's not really going to be able to double the opponents. He's really going for one shots, which isn't really the most consistent thing, especially when you're considering like a lot of save units use hardy fighter and hardy fighter is going to eat this up right like the damage direction piercing doesn't work on hardy fighter that's something we're going to have to consider with leon's effectiveness as a nuke maybe if he just can't nuke hard enough people won't use him but man this effect is just gross and i really am not looking forward to seeing it in like summer duels at all like i think it's just stupid okay so when it comes to roles for leon he's pretty much playing two roles his main role is going to be a nuke that's what he wants to nuke he wants to nuke as hard as possible and then his other role is going to be a support unit where he's turning off people's actions which is a very toxic way of supporting units but it's definitely support uh when it comes to game modes i think leon will mostly just be used in summer duels it's possible he's using ether raids defense but i'm not sure exactly how that will work out considering how the effect like turns actions off in ether raids differently than in summer duels so i definitely expect him to see him in summer duels i am concerned about like when it comes to his effectiveness how good of a nuke he is i'm really concerned about that because it seems like he could probably explode pretty easily or just not secure kills 
And if that's the case, um, he won't be as effective, right? Which is makes me sad because it's Leon, but it also makes me happy because like these effects are so disgustingly toxic in my opinion. Okay, let's move on to the final part of the video, should you pull. When it comes to the pros, we have some like really, really powerful units here, right? Legendary Mer is going to be a very meta save unit because she has anti-warping and warping is such a big deal in the meta. Uh, Ephraim is going to be a very offensive save. And then we have Duo Leon who is just ridiculous. Like I don't even know how he's going to impact the game because it's just gross the things he can do if he can actually get kills, right? So that's there. We also have some really good fodder on this banner as well. So that's definitely a big thing. And then of course, if you're like me and these are some of your favorite characters in Fire Emblem, you're definitely going to want to pull. When it comes to cons, we do have the Emblem Marth banner up right now. And I think Emblem Marth is such a big game changing unit because of the Emblem like engage mechanic. So that's definitely something you should consider pulling possibly here or waiting. Uh, we also have like the Desert Altina banner up as well, which has some very powerful units. And then we also have a Hero Rises coming in March, which possibly might have like the best banner of the entire year. So you're definitely gonna want some orbs for that as well. So that might be some reasons not to pull. Overall, I will be pulling on this banner, absolutely, just because these are some of my favorite characters in the game, like in all of Fire Emblem, so I have to pull. And I also have to do some testing because I'm really afraid of like the implications these units might have on the current meta. I'm really not a big fan at all, and I really want to hear about what you guys think. So drop a comment down below, letting me know, are you excited for these units because they're your favorites? Are you terrified of like all these just end turn effects and like just anti-warping and all this just disgusting nonsense? Just drop a comment. I really need to know about this. I really want to start a conversation down there. So let me know. As always, I'd like to thank all my members for their constant support. This has been Oblivion. I'll catch you all later with more Fire Emblem Heroes.